I'd like to share with you some thoughts on the questions I suggested that you reflect during the webinar. Let me start with the first question. What are the main surprises in our AI journey and why are they surprising? To me, a key takeaway was that both Amnon and Tommy emphasize the surprise that big data brought us so far. Indeed, one would expect that maybe we need new math, new models, new architectures, something different from transformers, maybe some other methodology, maybe some other approach. Yet, it proves that data by itself, together with an architecture like transformers, was enough to take us that far. That was very surprising. And it also highlights whether it's data that will take us further or whether it's another breakthrough. For example, a different architecture that will take us further. Another interesting surprise was what Tommy highlighted as the unreasonable effectiveness of what you can achieve by simply predicting the next world. However, there Tommy highlighted a potential warning. It could be the case that current progress in AI but re that relies on the prediction of next wo the next world and that relies on big data may be misleading and may lead us to hitting a wall. How far can big data take us? That's a big question. But there is also another question, which is, what is actually big data? I started considering after this discussion that perhaps we are not in a big data world. Perhaps we are still in a tiny data world. We still don't have data from all sorts of sensors, from sensors that capture our behavior, the way our mind works, our brain works, or sensors from everything around us. Perhaps we still have tiny data. Perhaps, and I'll go to the next point, we still don't have enough data that capture how we humans have been arguing and reasoning and discovering and developing different theories and different discoveries. A very important point made was the point of sequence-to-sequence -sequence AI models and about data that capture the chain of thought, the steps of reasoning. Think of data much like the chain of thought kind of data, where we go through all sorts of arguments, all sorts of debates between people, everything ever written and argued for in the human history, and capture the data of reasoning step by step from sequence to sequence, this data can be quite large. Imagine going as an argument or as a reasoning from a point A to a point B. There are many paths of reasoning. There are many A and B combinations. There can be potentially an exponential number of paths across all sorts of arguments and reasonings we have made or we can make. As Tommy mentioned at some point, if we had all the data for all the steps that a Turing machine, everything possible with computation, can make, then maybe we can actually achieve very high quality reasoning and potentially even higher capabilities from AI. Now, the number of possible steps, the number of possible reasonings we can do can be exponentially large. And currently we may have only a very tiny fraction of that potential data. How to get this kind of data of reasoning? It's a good question. Maybe AI can generate this. Maybe AI debating with AI can generate steps, chain of thought, sequence to sequence reasoning. Much like in AlphaGo version two, AI taught AI how to play. Notice also that sequence to sequence is like phrase to phrase. It's like how we communicate to each other ourselves, how we teach. You teach by communicating through sequences, a sequence being a sentence an argument, and you go from one argument to the next argument, potentially one argument that somebody says to an argument that somebody replies with. This is sequence to sequence. So everything we do for reasoning and argumentation is actually sequence to sequence data. And that's extremely interesting because it probably highlights, as was discussed, that simply with a lot of sequence to sequence data, we can actually teach AI much like we teach children and people to reason. Now, interestingly, this may be also why AI can achieve such a quote-unquote impressive performance on math tests and other tests. Today's best LLMs 
achieve something like 68% score in mathematical tests for high schools. This sounds impressive, and it has been surprising to many of us, as was highlighted during the discussion. However, one may consider this to be not very surprising with hindsight. As was discussed, 68% in a math test is what one would expect a student that memorizes, memorizes, overfits, overfits many example problems, many arguments and solutions and proofs can get by simply doing a little bit of pattern matching between the problems in the test and the problems and solutions and proofs and sequences, steps, step by step, chains of thought that the student may have read in the books. So in that sense, even though 68% in math sounds impressive, it may actually be an indication of a fundamental limitation of today's AI. Reasoning based on memorization and cut and paste, if you like, or pattern matching of proof steps of argumentations that one has seen in the past for similar problems, reasoning may be easy to achieve by seeing a lot of examples of reasoning, a lot of sequence to sequence, step by step. Then what is difficult? The difficulty may be going from 68% that somebody who has seen lots of reasonings and proofs can get to 100%. And the 100% in a math test may require something else. May require that somebody is able to also do abstraction. Now, what's the difference between reasoning and abstraction? Of course, that's a very complex question. But from the discussion we had, one can infer, for example, that reasoning is about, for example, explaining how the general theory of relativity works, what it means. We can explain to somebody else any theory that we have developed step by step, sequence to sequence, phrase by phrase. But coming up with the general theory of relativity from scratch, starting from point A and ending up with this theory, that's abstraction. Explaining how to go from A to B, where A and B are given, and we know what B is, is reasoning. And one can do with all sorts of sequences of phrases, of explanations. Abstraction is different. Reasoning, to give you another example, can be about explaining step by step, chain of thought data, about why a certain move, let's say the play of chess or the play of Go, is good or bad or why a certain proof in mathematics is good or bad. Abstraction is identifying new laws that govern, for example, how one plays well strategic games, not only chess, not only go, but all strategic games. Abstraction is about going from examples of good plays in chess, examples of good plays in go, examples of good games in other games, and abstracting what makes a strategic game player successful. Abstraction is about coming up with laws, like the general uh, relativity theory, or like the gravity laws, coming or economic laws, or laws about the financial markets, coming up with laws that have not been thought about before, that govern what we observe and what we can do from the data. And that may be what we are missing today. That may be what we need to overcome in order to be able to create AI that's a scientist, as was discussed. And of course, once AI is a good scientist, once AI can abstract and not only reason, which is what it can do today, more or less, then the question arises, what else can AI do then? If AI is a better scientist than what we can be, then perhaps AI can understand and solve problems we cannot solve. All sorts of problems, from how to cure cancer, to the aging questions, to the climate change, and anything else. That's also arguably why Tommy Poggio mentioned that the question of intelligence, the science of intelligence, is probably the most important question we have, the biggest scientific question we have. Because once we answer that, that solution can help us answer other questions. We then went to a quick question about large language models and economics and business. We saw how Amnon highlighted that maybe we don't yet know how to make the economics of large language models work. 
we see a very intense competition between all large language model companies these days and models. None of them so far makes money. Will they manage to get there? A very interesting highlight was when Amnon mentioned that he's foremost a scientist and then an entrepreneur. The answer to the question, how do you know when it's time to build something, when the technology is there? From what we heard, lies on the understanding that something is possible. Lies on understanding the science and engineering behind, in this case, AI, like computer vision and autonomous driving. And when we know that is possible, when we know something is feasible, then the next question is production at scale and making the economics, like funding and the business model, work. This is very much like making uh, the case for use cases in business. You have to understand the feasibility, not only the value, but also the feasibility. That's why it's also important that everybody understands something about both the math and science of AI and the engineering of it and all other aspects that we'll cover in this Global AI Leader Series. Interestingly, this made me think that maybe SpaceX or perhaps everything Elon Musk ever built was more a solution to how to do production at scale and how to make the economics work. It was not about having an answer to the scientific and engineering question whether something is possible. We knew that rockets are possible. We've been to the moon before. But getting them to production at scale with economics making sense was a different problem that SpaceX solved. Amnon's point was that sometimes the biggest innovations and the biggest business can and the biggest value is created when we understand the science and engineering feasibility. That also makes the link between science, engineering, and business. We then had a discussion about building platforms for AI products. For example, a platform on top of which you build different driving experiences. The idea of platforms is not, of course, new in business. We have platforms where we build different versions of the cars, an Audi, a Volkswagen, a Skoda. However, in this case, it takes a different meaning. What is common across different products or services that have AI embedded? For example, for cars, it may be vision. And what is what needs to be left to customization? For example, as we embed AI to products and services, we also make those products and services have a behavior, have a personality, have values, have a driving experience, be polite or not. Customizing the personality, behavior, and values of AI, of course, is important to do in order to make sure the AI fits to the context, the culture, the nation, the team where AI is embedded in or is used. Finding this line above which we customize something and below which we standardize, as we saw, it's not easy. And we'll have to do this for different products and business. Finally, hopefully you've been reflecting during the webinar about the question, what are the fundamental forces driving AI today? What are some breakthroughs we may have to make next? Where may this take us and when? Again, to repeat some of the main points, big data to took us very far, but will it take us further? Do we have really big data to begin with? Do we need another architecture beyond transformers, which as Tommy mentioned, there is no reason for us to think or believe that transformers fit anything any architecture we may have in our brain, and vice versa, architectures in our brain are not yet implemented in engineering architectures in AI. Will we be able to build AI that does not only take a math exam and gets a 68%, but can get a 100%? Will we be able to build AI that not only reasons, which may be easy, but also has the ability of abstraction? And will we build AI that has the capability to be a scientist? One of the biggest highlights, in my view, of this event, the first event, was when I asked the question to Tommy and Amnon about whether they think AI will ever become a better scientist than humans. They both said yes, with strong conviction. Amnon mentioned that this will happen in the next five years. 
So we thought it would be more longer. Whatever the time frame, they both said yes, and that's really an important point. Because remember, when that moment comes, when AI becomes a scientist better than humans and continuously improve and have its intelligence evolve, much like our intelligence evolved, another point Tommy touched upon, then this new scientist, this super scientist, will be able to solve problems we cannot solve. And of course, when that happens, new opportunities will arise. But of course, with power comes also responsibility. As we are entering this new world of AI that reasons, that generates language, and that eventually abstracts and does science, it's very important that we collectively understand not only the opportunities of these technologies, but also the potential risks. That we put in place governance structures and policies to ensure that we make the most out of these powerful technologies while managing the downside. That's why in this Global AI Leader Series, we will cover not only the technical and scientific aspects of AI that we start with today, but also the policy and business implications. We'll continue with the second event of the series on May 7 with Cedric O and with a view about AI from Europe, touching upon innovation in Europe, but also regulations. I hope you enjoyed the first event. Looking forward to seeing you in the second one on May 7. Thank you.